Okay. Um, I'm going to DigitalOcean and I'm going to spin up three droplets. Now, I tell you to go with the cheap $5 or $10. This is if you're going to run it for an extended period of time um, and you don't want to spend a lot of money. I will be honest with you, these smaller droplets struggle. Um, they, they do. The $5 droplets, they, they're quite tiny. They actually struggle with this. But I'm cognizant that uh, sometimes I talk to students and they don't have a lot of money and they, they just got $15 to run up the cluster and they're learning this thing at university. So that's the only option they have. So if you can go with the larger ones um, and if you seriously want response time, go with the $20 ones. So for this one, I'm going to spin this up. I'm going to deploy the workload. I'm going to tear it down. So I'm going to go with the $20 droplets. Um, so incidentally, this method that we're doing the install with, um, thanks to Vincent, um, is going to become the default installer method for Kubernetes, this Kube ADM. It's not thanks to me, but it's... it's no, well, messages. the great thing about Vincent is everything I think I discovered and I come into the channel, I'm going, guys, guess what happened, Vincent? Yeah, five minutes ago, I already posted that. <laughs> okay, so this method that we're doing the installer will become the default installation method um, for Kubernetes. Um, you can do this on CentOS, but there's more steps, which is why I'm going with Ubuntu for now. Um, so I'm going to go with these $20 images. If you want to run this for a longer period of time, go with the smaller ones um, so that it's, it's cheaper for you. But I will tell you that if you have response time problems, it's because um, they're struggling. And if you install HTOP and you just have a look at it, you'll see that like one of the worker nodes is maxed out at 100%. Okay, and it's just really struggling with the workload. Singapore. It's, it's so great to select Singapore as my data center because I'm always in Australia and there's like nothing near me. Okay. okay, so if you're following, just let me know if you need me to... Yeah. They're, um, they're doing quite a lot of work with the Prometheus side. Anybody know DigitalOcean here in Singapore? Or know anyone from DigitalOcean? They'll be cool to, to talk. I don't think they have a lot of stuff here. I think they use Equinix mm. as a center. <laughs> I want your business cards. <laughs> <laughs> start out with doing cloud stuff, I mean like before you have like the complicated Amazon requirements, having digital ocean is pretty awesome, like just five seconds, like okay, a little more than ten seconds and go change the world, I mean, lovely. I always feel better after working on digital ocean, they make me, um... Depends on what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's when you're very early, just start to play with it. Yeah, uh, Start adding load balancers. Yeah. I want to manage engineers. Oh. My master doesn't want to. Come on, you can do it. I'm going to blame Honest Bee's network. Yeah, I don't think this uh, control panel is running on our network. It's probably everyone else starting up images. Yeah, Equinox data centers are really. <laughs> Did anyone not get a sticker while I'm playing for time before I kill this guy and <coughs> everyone get stickers? Yep. On the enterprise level, right, Kubernetes with a gold fund right? But if you want to go big, let's say, how Did you just say cloud did you just say cloud foundry? Yes. Again or no? <laughs> cloud foundry, um too many opinions tonight. Um, how do you get your workload out of Cloud Foundry? You want it to run a pass on top of... Yeah, example, yes. So, yeah. example, yes. So, example, if you try to... So, the, our friends at... 
Cloud Foundry have, um, they, they developed their whole solution before um, there was Kubernetes or Docker, right? And they, they built an elegant solution. And even Red Hat with OpenShift were developing their own thing called Gears before Kubernetes came along. But, but Red Hat changed Gears when, <laughs> Gears changed Gears. They, they switched over to Kubernetes. They ripped it out and they replaced their orchestration engine. Now, Cloud Foundry, if you are, it's walled garden, like uh, as a pass, it's perfect if you're inside here. But again, my question is like, once you've developed the apps in here, how do you how do you get them out in into the next one and move them? Well, they, they actually had a very good talk on Next Seventeen about the uh, service brokers with Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Yep. So there's a very good talk about um, the development that Kubernetes team brings in. Yes. And uh, the idea there is like Cloud Foundry service broker is much more developed in terms of. Um, be building up a catalog of all the other services that are not really containers. It could be, for example, a database as a service hole somewhere in your enterprise network. So by letting the container YAML attach it, uh, attached to a service published by a broker from a, uh, from a Cloud Foundry perspective, uh, they somehow close these two worlds. There is no more gap. So they allow you to basically specify in your deployment profile Okay, as part of the deployment, I want this system environment and I want this like pod to attach to this MySQL or PostgreSQL service published by the service broker. So that's um, that's how they kind of start to come together. So uh, it will be interesting, but it's the beginning of a big journey right now. Yeah. It's not yet kind of like a solid answer there. Two months old. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an interesting project and I think it's got a lot of potential, especially for legacy environments. Yeah. Um, but environments that have to be able to abstract not only just the connection strings for a database or anything else, but to be able to generate temporary login credentials or anything else to make it really big and, and in Bloomix, for example, it's vice versa. So they run actually Kubernetes underneath Cloud Foundry. So you have to install IBM container extensions, ICEs, mm. under your Cloud Foundry as a plugin. And then you're able to deploy onto your, your build pack could become a container. So instead of like publishing into the native environment in Cloud Foundry, you can say whatever this is the build uh, this is the build profile but deployed into this instance of a container. So it's uh, it's also coming together in their world, but again, how it will transpire what we we'll see in a year. Rumor has it that Cloud Foundry is getting fairly friendly with Kubernetes as a base layer. Yep. Because it's kind of become that utility service yeah. that other people can build on top of. And there's already OpenShift, there's already Deus, um, and so you know, there is a push in some ways, but whether or not that eventuates is another question. Yeah, it's like one year from here. Okay, so my, my master has gone somewhere, nobody knows where. Um, I've spun up uh, four. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to um, use number four as mine. So if you're following along, you've, you've just got three. And they're numbered usually one, two, and three. And you've got the uh, public IPs, and you've got your party session ready to connect in and start cutting and pasting from the GIST page. OK, everyone good? OK, so I use Mobby Xterm. Um, so these are the three that I'm going to use. This is going to be my master and my two uh, worker nodes. Okay, so we've basically done this. We basically just spun up SSH keys, uh, the link for me, and I'm going with Ubuntu. You can do this on CentOS if you want. Um, I've included the links up here. So, so this guest is basically a summary of some other documentation that's got better documentation that's official. So I've just pulled out the Ubuntu pieces for this. Um, if you want to go see how this works, go, go grab this link. And if you want to do this on CentOS or something else, who likes Raspberry Pis? Yes, Kubernetes runs on Raspberry Pis on, and you can, this very same um, build step that I'm busy showing you now, you can put Hypriot OS on your um, Raspberry Pis and use Kubernetes and have a cluster going, Kubernetes cluster running on Raspberry Pis. I don't know what workload we're going to put on it, but it will be cool. Okay. Um, the next step is basically just uh, setting up the operating system. So in this particular case, you just grab each one of these, and I'm just going to do the um, multi-paste in all of them because it's common across all of them to prepare them. So it's the same set of um, steps. 
to set it up, okay? So basically, I'm just grabbing these commands and I'm putting them across onto each of them. So it's the same set of steps. Okay, it's ready. I still get hot pizza. So in, in any uh, Kubernetes one, they will try to support the more latest version of the Docker. So they stuck it pretty much at one dot twelve. And you and you and you know why? IP tables. Because because, because, because Docker isn't playing nicely. Yeah, I know they introduced to ARM as in build at one point, but actually my problem is that they said it was IP tables changes. Yes. In the drop. And why did they do that? Security. Did they tell anyone? Sure. No, they just did it. Uh, but, uh, but if you if you look at what like right now DockerCon is happening in America, right? And um, I always forget his full name. I know his uh, Twitter handle, Talking Thomas Hawking. Yes. Oh, yeah. He just uh, he was doing. They were doing a kind of a key keynote at Docker, and and they were like completely reverse. Uh, like right now they're saying like um, Docker is is like being playing very nice for Kubernetes. They donated their Docker daemon. Uh, container D. Container D. Uh, to the Cloud Native Foundation, and they said Containerd is practically written to run Kubernetes. Yeah. So, so they have this whole abstraction of the container runtime interface, so that, like as uh, James explained, you can you, you can run Rocket or you can run uh, Docker as the container runtime, and Kubernetes is just talking to the container runtime. And Container D, just now donated by Docker, is like perfectly written to that towards that. So, I don't know what's the status on on, on like. But I'm pretty sure that that's so they will come their own binaries for. Uh, no, no, Docker is split up, so they just split. Yeah, no, the CE and the, the community edition, enterprise edition, right? right? No, 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 more than that split off. I mean, the the the, the Docker solution itself has been split between a container uh, daemon, uh, a run run C, a container runtime uh, run that purely run the container, and um, what's the other thing like? Um, the swarm, right? The swarm is, is basically uh, additional API endpoints built in. But yeah, they, they completely split split off the parts. So you're able to just run the container D and then hook it up with run C. Um, so you're able to, to just let you need this kubelet talk to that. Yeah. OK. So, so just one other minor thing. It does work with Docker 1.13. Uh, I know. It's all if nice. you're using a later version of it. so. It, you just need to be careful. It's, uh, there are certified versions and there are versions that will work with you need to test it. So okay, so the operating system steps, these are just prep steps that you do on all of them. Okay, so just cut and paste these, multi, multi paste them and do them on all the nodes. It's, it's common on all of them. The very next thing you do is on the master, so just one of the nodes, select one of them. I selected uh, dot zero. You do the kube admin init, and this is the initialization command. Now, while they were talking, I kicked it off because it takes a bit of time to do, um, but at the end of it, what it's going to do is it's going to complete and it's going to spit out this uh, token join command. This join is what you run on the worker nodes to find the master, and that is the IP address that it's going to find it on. Okay, so don't don't run this on the worker nodes yet. We've got to do some uh, overlay networking and some other stuff on the master before you do this. So just grab this command and put it somewhere. We'll come back to it. So we've done that. We've got that join command. So grab that. But first we've got to we've got to finish doing these things. So this was interesting. I to do this last week. I said this took me two weeks to clean this up because. Um, 1.6 RBAC is now uh, default turned on in Kube ADM, and I couldn't log in because RBAC is turned on. So I did some work for you, and you've got to do these three commands, which you won't do in production, uh, to log in later. And this must be done as root on the master, only the master. Okay. Is it is it interesting? <laughs> it is, I think, interesting. Okay. 
Um, if, you've been not, if you've been looking at um, Diego Monica, who is the security lead of Docker, has been, there's been a lot of tweets about uh, owning Docker clusters, uh, basically where people um, are able to get the token that's published by, by Kubernetes by default inside a container, inside a pod. There's a default token published by Kubernetes, and using that, you can take full control of the cluster. So um, prior to RBAC, prior to 1.6, it's actually not that hard to um, get control of an API server or a Kubernetes cluster and spin up your own workloads and totally take control of the cluster. So it's very important, that this RBAC thing. It's very important that it's coming. to it. <laughs> it's right, right on time. <laughs> okay. So these three commands were basically because of RBAC um, that came in 1.6. The last thing that we're going to do is we're going to install the overlay network now. There's a couple of options here for you. Um, I go with Weaveworks because there's an optional um, category I give you down there. So because um, we all work for managers and managers need to see things to believe them, I believe in UIs. As many UIs as you can throw at management will get them across the line because seeing is believing. So I installed the Weaveworks because there's an optional category further on where Weaveworks will give you a UI, which is really quite nice for seeing the microservices application. It actually breaks it apart quite nicely for you and gives you the links between the nodes. Um, so if you're a fan of Flannel, uh, what do you guys use? Are you Flannel? Yeah, no, which network? Uh, which no, overlay? No. So, yeah, there's so there's a couple. Um, Calico, Canal, Flannel, Weaveworks. There's a couple of overlay networks, but I'm just going with. So this uses um, a primitive that I'll talk about now. It's called a daemon set. A daemon set is uh, now you've got your cluster running, and you want one particular container. It can be a logging container. It can be a monitoring container. In this case, it's the ne overlay network container. You want one container to run on every single node. This is a, an example of a daemon set. Okay, It's where, as an operations person, you've got a requirement, a use case, to just run one container everywhere. You use a daemon set. And this is using a daemon set to put the uh, Weaveworks container out on everything. So cut and paste this guy. And this is why I said you don't do the join yet because we've got to set up the networking. We've got to set up the security. This new coming up, which is Romana or VIPs, which is little IPs that you can write from run directly. So which is high performance, basically low latency. Romana, I yeah. heard about it. It's also a way of, what, of managing yeah, subnetting or exactly, cross nodes. Yeah, yeah, so it should give you like more granular on the, on the MAC address or something about like the conversion. So. Right. And, and that's where that name uh, jumps out, daemon set. So if you run any of these commands and you see daemon set uh, pop out, um, what they were asking you to do is they want one container and only one type of container to run everywhere within the cluster. And this is great because if you add a node later on, Kubernetes will see this node, it'll go, it doesn't have that particular container, and it'll, it'll add it to you. So you can just carry on adding nodes and Kube will go and add these daemon sets to it. So in this case, the network will go. Um, is there anything else I need to know there? No. Okay. So the master's done. It's all the prereq steps and the RBAC steps, and we've set up the overlay networking. The next thing, uh, let's quickly do the dashboard because if you can't see what you're doing, okay. Is there any everybody with, with you? Like, anybody stuck somewhere? Okay. No, everybody's good? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to quickly, I'm going to skip the dashboard and I'm going to go to the join because we've got the join command over here. So you grab this command, you grab this, and what you do now is you go to the two worker nodes and you just join. Okay, you go back to the master and your first command, kubectl get nodes. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> you can do dash W to watch it. Thank you. you can. Yeah. So it's just going to be there. One's ready. Okay, so one of the worker nodes has come up. Okay, now 
we've built one master and two worker nodes. In Kube ADM, by default, it puts what they call a taint on the master. And a taint basically means that no work will ever be provisioned to the master. You don't want the master doing application work. That's what the workers exist for. Okay, so by default, if for some reason you deploy your application and you can't for your life figure out, I've got three nodes, one of them's a master, but I want it to do work, the master is not going to do work. It's currently got um, labels set up, and they call them taints, which basically excludes it from any workload. Okay, so whenever you look, if once you go pull this apart on the weekend or whenever you do it, and you actually go in and you do do it, um, And you go through, so also, another thing that I had to get my head around is that Docker still exists in this whole ecosystem that we're doing now, right? All that we've done is we've put this lifecycle management on top of Docker. All, the, all your Docker commands that you know, um, uh, the logs, Docker start, Docker stop, all the Docker commands will still, still work. So in this particular case, I'm just doing a PS, I'm listing all the containers that are running and Docker is responding to me with everything that's running on it. Okay, so application workload won't run on the master. Um, there, it actually tells you on the main page, if you want to provision work onto this, there's a, several commands to remove the taints or remove the labels and, and work will come to it. This took me um, a day to figure out. I had another client who wanted to use his master as a worker and clients are always right, so I had to make it do that. You said this form by default basically does it as a in theory, you can create the master, but the master is based on the swarm grouping. You can run this. Uh, Docker captain? <laughs> swarm. <laughs> Does swarm have the concept of a master, or are they all. You can add it to the master, but basically yeah. you have a rough protocol, which is basically yeah. you negotiate, so and the same master can run as well the container. Basically. You know? Yeah, so the same thing um, when, you cr when you create a Docker swarm cluster. Um, it has managers, multiple managers, uh, and basically they took the etcd, um, you know, implementation of Ruft in the managers, and um, I think by default the master is also not schedulable, um, and you can also just set up a label that you can schedule workloads on top of it. It's exactly the same concept, you can set the labels on it. Because I remember running a demo, um, I think maybe by default is enabled to run the... It's enabled, it's enabled, yeah. it's enabled because... because I was running a demo of Docker Swarm 1.13 and uh, where I was showing um, some of the features and one of the things was it didn't work because the, 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 the master was, sorry, I'm gonna go back again. The, the thing was we had the Vote app and the Vote app has a database and the, the database um, schedule had a, a, um, a requisite that it had to run on the master. And when I ran it, by default, it didn't spin up. The, the database wasn't getting scheduled. So I had to actually go to the master and enable scheduling to make the whole thing work. Um, so I'm pretty sure that actually by default it doesn't run. Right? No, because I run, I remember, I tried another demo, I run, I put free, and yeah. then put any workers, I put yeah. all the master. And between okay. them, they just schedule. So if you have a small swarm, yeah. everybody's a master, basically, as long as you more than free. You could do that if you want, yeah. yeah so then it, you can in schedule it, and then at least the resiliency. Yeah, in my case, I, I created a cluster with one master to, to workers, and I was running the vote app, which runs Redis and the database, and the database has a volume on the node. And because it was a single master, they scheduled the database on the master, uh, but by default it wasn't running. Like, it was not getting scheduled, and I had to actually like, make, make the master. But anyway, it's working exactly the same way. It doesn't matter if it's the default or not. But why, why uh, is there any way to run console instead of ABCD? Yes. Uh, as a backend for Kubernetes? No. Um, n no, not okay. So the other thing I want to tell you about Kubernetes is it's super pluggable. Um, so the API API server is like the only mandatory piece of the Kubernetes solution. So if you're a fan of HashiCorp um, and you want to use um, console service discovery, you can actually replace the service discovery that comes with Kubernetes with HashiCorp. Same with Vault. Um, so Kubernetes has got its own way of managing secrets and configs, but if you're a HashiCorp user and you like Vault, you can use that. So they've made it to be very um, pluggable. Um, even the scheduler can be replaced with another third party. I'm going to use HashiCorp again. You can figure out I'm a fan of HashiCorp's um, stuff. Um, so you can use the scheduler. Uh, I, I don't know if it's called Nomad or 
whatever the HashiCorp is. Is it? So you, if you've got those components already in your organization and you're using them, you, you should be able to plug them in and extend it to use it. The only thing, as Vincent said, the only thing which is completely mandatory is the master, the API server is the only mandatory component um, that you must have, and there's an etcd cluster behind that that's doing the key value store. Is there any reason why they chose etcd? Because I remember two, two three years ago, was the Swarm was using the console? Um, the core OS was using etcd version 1 at the time. So, it, so etcd's come come quite far. They've moved over to gRPC as their protocol internally now. So it scales and it's much quicker than it was before. Version three. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why not console, but I remember Swarm Docker Swarm uh, version one before yes. Swarm mode was using console. Uh, actually, was using libkv like an abstraction above a key value store. So you could talk to I, you could you talk to yes. library key value store, and then behind it could be etcd, zookeeper, or uh, console. Uh, or you can store it directly. I remember I was using yeah. it directly with the console. Right. So yeah. Uh, Sorry, did you get past your problem now? Uh, no, rebuilding. So I actually at that point I didn't I couldn't connect to IP server. So it was just for some reason not responding to AE port on master. Uh, are you on Are you on DigitalOcean? Yeah. It was basically not responding. There was no service deployed as part of like what that get was bringing me. So I'm just oh yeah. really scratch. Okay, is is everybody else roughly at the same point? Those that were able to follow. So all I've done now is I've installed HTOP um, on the two worker nodes um, to show the the load, and I'm back on the master. So if you've run your first Kubernetes command, kubectl get nodes. Um, kubectl can be pronounced in three ways. I found out. Um, in the universe, it can be kube control, kube ct. I call it uh, kube ctl, and you can call it kube cuddle. Um, so whichever one you want to call this main way of interfacing with Kubernetes, choose whichever way you like, and you can make it yours. So you've done kube control get nodes. You should have the master. Um, they're all running um, 161, which is quite uh, recent, and we've got the two worker nodes. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the dashboard. And the reason I'm going to do the dashboard is there is a bit of mind trickery that I had to figure out in how to get the UI out. So grab this. Um, this is exactly an example of the manifest file that I was explaining. Kube control create and input it to a file. And this Kubernetes dashboard.yaml, if you actually go in and edit it, you'll see it is actually, um, it's a definition of an application inside Kubernetes. So you can actually go and edit it. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually taking that manifest file, I'm grabbing it from the origin page, and I'm basically giving it to my cluster. I'm saying, install this for me, please. So on the master only. OK, it's done. Um, so remember I talked to you about that primitive, um, the service? This is the service, this Kubernetes dashboard. So the containers running the dashboard are running in the background now, but there's a service that's fronting it. When I want to interact with the dashboard, I actually talk to the service. The service will proxy me to the cor correct container that's running it. And Kube is keeping, keeping the whole thing alive. This was also a command I had to put in for RBAC 1.6, or I couldn't um, I couldn't log into the um, the dashboard. Yeah, it talks to the Kubernetes API to get all the servers and things, so it's that permissions. So I actually put this in here for you. Um, so before this, you just would do this and then get in, but I've, I found out you have to actually create this user, um, and it's for RBAC changes. Okay, now. The way to figure out where this is running to get your first UI up is basically um, we take a worker node and we take the service port. Now, you won't do, you'll only do this in this, this lab exercise. You, you will never do this um, in production. You'll do it more now. So, you know the worker nodes that we deployed? We've got the master and the two worker nodes. And this is the master. The worker nodes have got an IP address. Okay, go get the IP address of any one of these worker nodes. Okay, we need the IP address of this. Then we're going to execute a kube command over here, 
and it's going to throw out a high range port number above 32,000. To get to the UI, I need that port and I need an IP from here. So it's going to be the IP address of a worker plus this high port range. And when you put that together into your uh, browser, the UI is going to come back. Don't ask me to explain why or how. Yeah, but this is Okay. If there's an easier way, tell me. I mean, the swarm. I know the swarm was using the internal in the, the proxying, right? The routing. So you, can, you can apply any port of the any API address of the cluster or the machine. Basically, you can put internally. To the yeah, you you don't use this. So uh, so we're doing this for this lab exercise. You would actually use something like an ingress controller or a load balancer properly, but. Assume they're just students and they just want to get the UI to come up, okay? And because we're exposing, we're exposing the service on one of the node ports. So a node port is the worker. That's why I asked you to get the IP address of one of the workers. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go to one of my workers and I'm just going to grep for the Ethernet. So on one of the worker nodes, I'm grabbing the IP of one of the workers. And I'm doing kub control get service in that namespace. I'll quickly talk about namespaces. Ah, oh, that's a worker. Got to do it on the... Okay, that high range port number. It's going to be different for everybody. Okay, so mine will not be the same as yours. So you grab that high port range. Okay, so see what I did there? So now I grab that high port range, that node port, and I throw it into a browser. If you configure the YAML file to specify which port you want to, it should work, right? This is dynamic. dynamic uh, this is dynamic. W without modifying any of this, I want them to be able to get the latest version that the projects are working on, pull them in. And maybe the pain of going through this will help them understand some of the, the stuff. So did everybody get a UI? Yes. I'm not such a bad teacher after all. Okay, let's quickly talk. You do have Q control on your local machine. There are ways of port forwarding behind firewalls and proxying and those sorts of things which can make this. Um, Thanks, Hunter. You've just volunteered for the next talk. <laughs> Thanks, champ. That's a very valuable lesson. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> um, that was another question I was going to ask. What kind of frequency um, makes sense for this kind of user group? Um, once a month, twice a month, how much of this can you... Uh, there's a lot of user groups in Singapore, a lot of interesting user groups. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of content that's out there. So I'm just trying to get a feel for is once, once a month... Um, by month. Weeks. Based on VMAX, I mean, I was uh, doing VMAX with Benj Benjamin George. You probably heard about this guy. You heard about Benjamin? Yeah, I've heard his name. So, yeah. so we, were, we were doing VMAX a couple of years ago. It basically, it's kind of tanks on the third or fourth occasion if you do it monthly. Mm -hmm. So it's rather six weeks or eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Hunter. You can start getting ready. And I heard it's being hosted at Google. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your your UI has come up. Okay, so so if you've got this, give yourselves a hand. Well done, if you've got them up. I've given you the instructions to go tear this down, build it up on your own um, on your own time, and get into the UI. These are the most important things. You've got it up, you've prepared it, you've deployed it, and you've got the UI. If you quickly go through this, the the quick thing I want to talk about is namespaces. Um, namespaces are this awesomely cool function inside Kubernetes for doing soft isolation between applications. Okay, you can run on one cluster, you can run three environments, dev, test, and prod, right? Using namespaces to isolate them so that the applications running in the namespaces can't see the other namespaces. Okay, so from a utilization point of view, I've given you X amount of money for hardware, but now I'm using namespaces to carve up the same hardware. And because I'm using manifest files to drive the applications, I do test, 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 
move to the next environment on the same cluster. Okay, you'll never do this, right? You'll actually only have your test dev, um, user acceptance testing, and do namespaces there, but your prod will be its own set of hardware, okay? But namespaces are basically isolation that you can use. So there's nothing viewed here because I'm in the default namespace. So I would have to do, so you do the click down here and you see these um, default namespaces that Kubernetes created for system. So what we're gonna do now is almost there. I can see Vincent's itching. We, we're gonna deploy a microservices application um, onto this so that you can deploy your first app and see what it looks like inside the UI. Okay, so it's called Sock Shop. Okay, um, it's a microservices, it's an example of a microservices application. Um, so what you do is on the master and the master only. So I just explained to you what namespaces are. So in this case, I'm creating a namespace called Sock Shop and this microservices app is gonna go. And nobody's taken pictures of me and put it on Twitter. I've just realized the camera came out. Are you sure? I get, I think, um, somebody I, has I get paid for Andrew? Twitter. Oh, did you? I like the uplinks. Okay, so we've got to create a namespace for Sock Shop. So back on the master. So again, this is grabbing the file and inside the namespace of Sock Shop, I'm applying the file which I'm going to get over here, uh, demo. Okay. All the primitives I spoke about on the whiteboard, services. So here you see how they do a deployment, but then they create a service in front of it. So the, the pod that wants to run the app is sitting behind a service that users will interact with the service before getting to the pod. And if you're gonna do upgrades, you upgrade the pod and you do rolling updates to the back end, but the, but the service is stable. Um, in this particular case, I think they actually do some volumes. Some of these have volumes that they need to be created. Okay. Um, so do they use the consistent storage? Or? No, these are just, they're just doing like empty volumes, scratch, scratch spaces uh, for the containers. But thanks for volunteering to do a talk on persistent I think volumes. I wants to talk about persistence. <laughs> Who? Uh, the LMD. Yeah. That's very, that's very interesting. We can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the next most important command you're ever going to learn is get pods. Okay, so get pods in the namespace. So when you when you talk to the cluster, you have to actually tell it inside which namespace you want to look. If I gave if I did this without the namespace, without sock shop. And it's a namespace, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a short version for namespace. And this is defined in YAML, which is when it's created, when you import it in YAML file, or you, could, you don't create it separately. I created it separately, yeah, but you can create it in the manifest file. You can, so by the way, you can, you can build up your whole microservices app with your namespace definition, your pod definitions, your services into this giant file. Um, the Sock Shop is a really good exp uh, uh, example of like a really complex deployment that you that is been put into a single file except the namespace wasn't there on, on the on the yaml side right how do you if you want to have a clean <coughs> structural code right instead of having one huge file like cloud formation or whatever like a huge one can you structure the yaml file to read from another yaml file for example Vincent? to structure the code <laughs> like you can split out yaml files into multiple files um, and then just record and include a directory to pull them all in. For example, there are Terraform. If you want to do nested YAML files not in default Kubernetes, you can use things like Helm to manage the deployment configuration, which can do it. Okay. I quickly want to show you. So I'm doing kube control get pods. And inside Kube system, these are all system related pods that are running Kubernetes. If I do sock shop, I'm looking at a different one and you can see these are all the microservices that I've asked um, to run. So if we go back to our UI, Kubernetes dashboard, and I change my namespace to refresh. Okay. 
Okay, so what happens now is we've deployed the microservices app and inside the UI, I've changed my namespace to SockShop and I can see all the deployments that have run. Um, you can see the images. There's no daemon sets, there's no stateful, there's no jobs, there's no pods. Um, the services which front end this are over here. So to get to those pods, you come through these services that are over here. Um, how much time have we got? Because I can show, I can, getting into the front end of this is exactly the same as getting into the... To get the, the port and the... Yeah, you, you basically... Right? Yeah, you basically do the same thing. You get um, the IP address, you do sock shop front end, and you take the IP and the... I'm just well, gonna. I'm just. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do it. You already have an IP. Thank you, Vincent. Can you edit out sarcasm from this video or not? <laughs> it was my sarcasm. <laughs> okay. Here's my high port. Ah, this is an example where they hard coded it. It will always be 3001. So in this manifest file, remember this now. They've actually hard coded the port that it'll be on. So if you take that guy and you just do that. I'm not a fan of Edge. Um, so, Devin, I'm going to tell you this. You make Chrome and you make Kubernetes, but you don't have the Kubernetes UI display nicely inside Chrome. I have to run Firefox or Edge. And I have created an application. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you've got your app up and this works. Um, you can go in. I've I've left the user IDs. Um, these are the user IDs that are valid for the app um, to log in as different users. Um, this app, you can... You can... So it, it's fully functional. You can you can play around with this. The whole point here is I wanted you to build a cluster on Kube, understand the primitives that it gives you, take an application and deploy it on top of it and then run it. And this is yours to pull apart now in your own time. Go and have a look at how the master is. Use the UIs to basically understand. Go, go figure out what these, um, these primitives are that Kubernetes is offering you and what each one is doing and why is it doing it. So hopefully, I'm wrapping down, um, you learned something to, today. You know more about Kubernetes now than when you came into this session. And my South African accent is now... Well, my question is not to scale, right? So... On Google or on Azure, because they integrated with the Kubernetes. Let's say if I'm running OpenStack or Amazon, right? Amazon has their own auto scaling module, right? which is scaled based on different parameters, U, memory, whatever. So, and as well, the Kubernetes have this. You can specify parameters. How do you scale it? In? How do you merit in both? Any way to merit? So I can only tell you I've watched people give talks about using Prometheus. Um, to decide when to actually do the scaling. Um, just looking at the utilization of the node. So we're getting into monitoring across in a cloud native stack is a bit more complicated than in the old world where you just watched the VM and if the VM got hot, you knew that you were facing a problem. Here, so something that you need to understand about this is your workload can live anywhere in the stack. So traditional monitoring kind of goes out the window because it's not pinned to a specific host, right? If I, the service is available, but if I redeploy the container, it can deploy anywhere that, that Kubernetes decides, the scheduler decides where to put it. So monitoring becomes a problem, which is why Prometheus is interesting because Prometheus is designed to actually monitor these cloud natives. So from a scaling point of view, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that probably watching the, the host node is not a good indicator that you need to scale because the workload on top of it is transient. It could be there now, it could be not there tomorrow when you do a rolling update. So basically, you integrate from materials to Lambda functions, which is trigger the new instances and adding the... You have for, if you're talking about Lambda, you're talking about Amazon, you actually have autoscalers for Kubernetes that are integrated with Lambda APIs. Oh, sorry, with uh, Amazon APIs. So you, you so can... The autoscaler itself? Yes. You the elastic scaling, the elastic. Yeah, I, I, we're not using it at the moment, but we're looking at it. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's possible to deploy a Kubernetes uh, pod that talks to the Kubernetes API to find out the utilization of the nodes uh, and looks and then auto-scales the group to have more workers. 
I think they, they actually alpha, there was just an alpha release for like uh, the ability for replica controller to add faults. Uh, I think this is the very, very fresh one, like a two month old feature. You, you also have a port auto scaler. Yes. So that's two, two so they, 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 would, they would do the port auto scaling based on CPU, RAM, and external events. So yeah. this is something that they pushed like very, very recently. There's a, there's a few add-ons for horizontal auto scaling. Horizontal auto scaling. Yeah. yeah, I was talking about the actual Amazon auto scaling group scaling out, so adding more resources to the cluster. To the node nodes itself. Adding more nodes. Oh. And then the other option is obviously to uh, like scale out the pods, which uh, who I mean <laughs> the company that with the uh, Philips Hui. Uh, they Hui. have these lights. They have their Internet of Things. Hui. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't <Hui>. see. <laughs> uh, so um, they they actually build their own uh, auto scaler that looks at the number of connections to a pod and then scales out the number of the pods. So they, they have like custom auto scalers. I don't think if they, I don't know if they put that open source, but they definitely talk about it. Yeah. So yeah, but this auto scaling of pods is, is, is very big as well. And on the nodes, uh, yeah, it's, it's a platform specific thing. It's uh, I think it's a little bit easier um, mm -hmm. just from the uh, regular AWS or Google platform standpoint, just to look at the nodes actual utilization. And right, it out. in Google, Kubernetes engine it does it automatically, right? I mean, you can yeah. when you create the cluster, you can say auto scale automatically from me add more nodes when there needs. Need to be more yeah, you define like from to. Yeah. So it's all really cool. Okay. I think when you were saying play with the cluster, I thought about killing a node, <laughs> but maybe the data is. Uh, no. Uh, no. 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 I will stop you from having pizza because I can. Um, Okay, that guy's gone. So, so what, what, what <coughs> Vincent's basically talking about is I told you this is lifecycle management for your containers. So one of the most important things is the ability to recover and keep running so that you don't have to get called in to do work. So what we're going to do now is very carefully destroy one of these whole nodes and then watch the UI to, to make sure that the sock shop continues to run. Maybe okay. Oh, let's kill it. See what happens. Can you do a master? Now <laughs> uh, we have a single master. Come on. <laughs> Take the sticker away from that guy. <laughs> That's when your question is too intelligent. <laughs> um, In theory, your containers will still run. Yes, yes, So you probably can, but it's <laughs> untested. Um, if, if Vincent, if I kill it completely and it continues to run, that is a better show than rebooting it because rebooting is like kind of cheating. Do you have resources? But we'll find out. Okay. But you're connecting to the worker node directly, right? Yes. yes. The IP address. So if you kill that worker node, then yeah, that's okay. Connect to the other worker node. It's okay. You just connect to the other worker node. You just grab the. Okay. So what's going to happen is, oh, this guy's gone. Okay, so one of them is completely gone. And memory footprint on the server, for example, if I run Kubernetes, is it any, if I would run just a container and in the cluster with the Kubernetes, all these dependencies, what would be the, the memory footprint? Oh. Of, the, of the master? On the, uh, the <coughs> Working notes. Yes. It's a few, maybe a hundred things. It's not a lot. And you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, so it's quite happy there. On iOS and networking, any any additional stress? Very low. Sorry, it, it shouldn't be taking up a significant amount because you want your applications to be using all of that. So it's a like from IO, it's a copy and write, so it's a continuous. Like these snapshots are from Docker, right? So it's copy and write. It's not redirecting, so it's continuously kind of puts together the new thing that if you, it's in persistent state, right? In persistent. So if you're writing something inside the container, it will be a continuous, kind of very, very spindle aligned write, so no need to worry about it. And this is the beauty, this is what separates from containers from virtualization. You don't need like any kind of shared hybrid mode SAN, you just run it within. Five three. Is it the correct uh, no? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So we killed we killed one of the no the worker nodes completely, um, but the app is still up. Yeah, it's it's struggling. Trust me, um, I've, I've built a Raspberry Pi tower that I'm running Kube on, and then I do Nginx containers across them, and then I actually pull out the power to them, and you actually just watch it gracefully move the workload to the next one. So I, I do know it works. Um, I was one of the next talks I want to do is actually bring it in and then do the live fire. We pull out the we pull out the power and do it. Any questions? Everything. Be very careful. Kill the namespace. You kill everything in it. It's like uh, R minus R recursive. Namespace kills everything. Yep. On the flip side, it stops. Uh, yeah. On the other way, it's a great way to clean out your system. <laughs> namespace gone. What if the registry server, I mean, Docker registry server, is not connecting? If the nodes are not connecting to the Docker registry, then you d the pods don't get populated with containers. Well, at least it will run continuously. Or the first run or subsequent yeah. runs? The first run is it pulls. Yeah. It pulls yeah. and then it runs. Um, subsequently, it doesn't need it doesn't need the registry for anything unless you want to deploy a new manifest that does an update of the container. And if it can't reach it, it's not going to do anything because it couldn't pull anything across. Or so it will run the old version. It continues to run the old version, but tell you that it couldn't connect. But if you add new host to the cluster? Yeah, that's yeah, the so next question. Why, it won't. So each node is dependent on its own Docker, Docker uh, local cache. Okay. Um, but if you run a caching Docker registry in your cluster, then you can cut off your external connectivity and have fully replicated Docker containers that are behind your firewall. So you mean we, we can make a central caching server? That's right. Okay. It's like a squid proxy. Yeah, like a squid proxy. Or Artifactory, which is basically caching the containers anyways. Okay. Yeah. So the Artifactory. Did, you add, did your thing work this time? Yeah, I've seen the socks. <laughs> so, right now you bring you brought down a, um, one of the workers, right? So, uh, let's say you have uh, you deploy additional like two or three microservices on the master. So, once these um, workers get back up, we, you would do the rest of the thing automatically. The master, the master has got a scheduler um, that tries to figure out where's the best place, and because the new node has come up and it's empty, the scheduler will basically go this this guy is empty and it'll automatically start putting workload onto it. So scheduling is something that you don't worry about anymore because Kube will figure out where to put the stuff for you. That's why I said you won't actually even know which host your app is running on anymore because one day it could be here, the next day when you do an update it could be running over there because Kube is deciding an operating system for your data center. The more you start to think of it like that, the more it starts to make sense. What is the limit? Limit of? Any limited? Yeah, for example, you have three you know, you know, three hundred containers, five hundred containers. I mean, is it any limit? You can There's a. It's sitting at. Uh, it's at five thousand. So this current version of Kube is either sitting at five thousand or ten thousand nodes. Nodes. Five thousand nodes. Basically, half of board cell. So it's like almost like fifty percent of what this super company does. So you don't build cells more than ten thousand. So one cluster. How many ports can you accommodate? Well, that's dependent on the amount of RAM or memory. Across five thousand nodes, but they're not. They're all the same. But per machine, the machine it depends how much memory the machine has because each. Any detect any memory, for example, limit. If, for example, it's a machine that's outside the limit, and the cube is still try to schedule. Oh no! No. The scheduler will say it cannot schedule the workload. So it's it has there some is no monitoring on the memory or. There is no memo over commit. It's not like VMware. You can't have memory pressure because you containerize. You basically are forced to present a segment of RAM to the application inside a container. This is the. 30 year old containerization concept, right? So there is no thing like memory mapping or memory sharing or memory compression or whatever like we got used to from VMware. There's nothing like that. So it's hardcore. You basically leak 10 megs uh, or like 20 megs out of like RAM, you cannot put another container. So it's very, very precise. So, but at the same time, 
you will have very, very different containers, right? So some of them consume small amount of RAM, and this is where Kubernetes will place all those. It's like dynamic resource scheduler in VMware. But again, there is no thing like memory pressure or CPU, like c CPU aside, like there's no thing like memory compression or memory sharing, right? So basically what you're saying is as long as you have a capacity on the server, yeah. It'll run. That's why, any number of the correct. Th that's why the auto scaler design should be like similar nodes. You cannot add instances of different types. If you if you want to do like an auto scaler for the nodes, you have to pick up okay what I'm able to pay for. Um, what will my boss not fire me for basically? If you add like ten superpower nodes on the spike of the capacity and then you don't destroy them, right? So you cannot have like small, 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 large, large, large because it's it's not it's not the best practice. You have to have like a single layer of um, eight core, ninety six gigs nodes or something like that, and then it will be very homogeneous. You can actually do you can actually have special nodes with labels like for uh, like if you need to have a couple of nodes that have GPUs for um, like uh, AI post like TensorFlow. Yeah. You can have yeah. nodes within your cluster that are labeled that they have, uh, and then when you schedule your workload, you tag it that it needs to have a node with GPUs. Uh, I'm not saying that right now you can, like, the support of GPUs is maybe still in alpha on Kubernetes, yeah. but um, but it's possible to have different types of nodes. Right? I, would d I would just deploy a separate cluster for that. Mm -hmm. It's basically a design decision. Uh, one of the enterprise, right, one of the problem with uh, companies, you, in the time you acquire some hardware, once you want to switch to the Kubernetes, you deal with the different types of the hardware, so you don't have a choice. Buy R630. <laughs> <laughs> You can you can have mixed nodes in that environment. We, <laughs> yeah, we do for we do with our VML deployments for Kubernetes. We have um, you know, blade servers. So anyone's familiar with the HP Mercury, I'm sure there's a few HP people here. Um, or the NEC ser uh, servers. But um, then we also have so we have microblades, and then we have large scale storage servers, which we have in a in a full cluster. And then we tag particular nodes that will like handle certain workloads. Can you like yeah. tag it to the namespace? For example, say you add these nodes to the namespace, and then you know that your application, this namespace, will run only in the specific. Yeah, so you're talking about labels. Um, so I had to do that. Labels on a namespace, but you can do it on your pods. My grace. Sorry, I forgot I have a call. So no worries. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a whole nother talk is labels and how t uh, everything in Kube is a label. Um, so we'll, that's something else we've got to talk about. Sorry, Devin, you had a question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, actually the current problems uh, we are facing is that uh, we are having a lot of end of us drives and we are moving towards uh, to uh, Kubernetes. So what would be the best option? Uh, because we are also thinking to integrate with the uh, Azure block storage. So, so storage is a is a talk com yeah, so completely on its own. So I'd save that for the pizza. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. So, what if the master node goes down? Does it auto recover or? Um, so, you you deploy your masters in HA, and you put them in front of a service. So that if they go down, that the service will select the next master. Um, so in production, you never you never do single no uh, single master. This is purely for play. Um, in production, you always deploy your masters in HA, and usually three. So what are you are you running threes? Five. Five. Because we did some manual operations on the masters. Actually, it's not the m okay. So there's two separate components here. One is the at CD this uh, cluster and two is the API servers. So in our case, because we wanted to save uh, resources, we put our etcd together with our master, which means that we are running a like highly available etcd cluster of five. And that's actually the only component that we want to have uh, like highly available. Um, well, actually the master, so actually we could do like a three, three node um, etcd cluster, two node master cluster, and then a couple of like 10, 10 workers. Um, but we are running five etcd nodes because we were doing manual operations on it. And if we by mistake, you know, if you have five, you can support up to two node failure. You still have like three majority uh, among among the cluster. So if you do three, you can have one node failure. And we had three, and we had we, we brought down one node, and then by mistake, we took out another node, and consensus was gone, and we didn't do an automatic recovery from snapshot or anything like that. 
So we lost our consistent state that way. So that's why we were in five, because we're late. <laughs> we just went five. Yeah. Is it, is it any way, for example, let's say, even for three nodes, if one node go down, you can, one of the ports, one of the, become a master to basically to program it. Is yeah, so, so, so the masters, like the, the API servers, they actually run multiple components. The API server itself is completely stateless, and you can have, like, it doesn't matter where it's running. Like, if you have two masters, the API server will, not, will run on both, and you can load balance across. Uh, there are controller, like, the scheduler is actually maintaining or changing state. So when uh, the scheduler needs to make a scheduling decision, he's changing the state of the cluster, so you can only have one. And they can do uh, master election using etcd. So if you have two nodes running master services, then you can s make sure that uh, the scheduler, if that one that node stops responding, then the other scheduler will take the, 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 the lead and start uh, making scheduling decisions. And that's automatic. Uh, you don't need to like program that in. That's, that's already there. The controller loops are also, the controller manager is also a single, single uh, the tricky. The tricky part then just becomes, how do I identify where my API server's gone? So you usually have to have a load balancer sitting there. Well, yeah, if you consistent IP address or right. IP address or however you want to do high availability IP address. But, but I mean, you're always, if you have two nodes of API servers, you're always, if you put a node balancer, you always talk to do your API servers. Your controller scheduler, your controller uh, and your scheduler, you never talk to. They just switch between them. Uh, but yeah, you do need to have a load balancer to make sure that you're talking to the, the, mask, the API server that's alive. Yeah. One more question. Anyway. What would be the drawback if we use Kubernetes? There is none. It's all goodness. <laughs> Your life will become infinitely better. Your LinkedIn profile will get so many hits you I won't care. believe it. <laughs> and now we're talking, right? Like resume SEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got nothing to... If, you, if you're an ops person and you've come from a history of ops and struggled with, okay, life is developers going like this direction and ops is going that direction, okay? Go slow, go fast. This thing is the first thing that, I, this is the, the most perfect operations platform I've come across in my life. Okay, it allows you to move at the same speed as the developers, really. Because there's this layer of abstraction, and whether they hurt themselves, you can roll back, and you can move forward really quickly with your apps. So all of a sudden, instead of this two-speed economy running inside your company, it's like one speed, and you're just, you're just running with them the whole time. And it, it works. Yeah, because the separation between Google, I mean, it's really about, once you have this pod, you have maybe a logging team, right, or a security team, et cetera, you deploy in there, and those teams can run independent of one another, right? And push their updates as they need uh, versus everyone needs to be, can even be on that same page. But you it's a very legacy system we're handling. <laughs> That's where the, uh, everything coming in because the huge big database and different patching servers. Well, you saw Honest Bee was hosting this tonight because they, they're looking specifically for these skills. Oh. Okay, this is, this is what they're looking at. tell you what, what is a legacy system. <laughs> <laughs> Like 30 years ago, like it was a cobalt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Says whatever you write today is legacy tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So there's pizza next door. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you everyone for coming, and probably see you in six weeks. Thanks, guys. Okay.